Hello, networkers, and welcome back to another episode of Ask a Network Engineer, where I will answer one of your questions. And this question came in by email, and I thought it was a great question. And this question is by Matt, and he asks, I just wanted to ask your advice about transitioning from engineer to architect. In your experience, I'm curious about how you transitioned and what resources or experiences you had in order to make that transition. So let's talk about that. It's not as traditional as you think it is, but let's talk about that. Okay, so transition, it never happened. It was something that occurred while on the job as a senior network engineer. I mentioned this before, that as a senior network person, you will have different roles. One of them will be an operational role where you're doing configuration and support, but you also do design work as well. And this is even for medium and large size companies that I was a part of. Because design work isn't a full-time position. Now as a consultant, that's different because companies can bring you in for a project, it takes me four or six hours and I'm done. But as a network architect position, those are more for the very, very large companies. So for me, I was a senior network engineer and the management team would go to their senior network person and they would say, we need a solution to accommodate these requirements. I remember one of my projects that I worked on was having an online e-commerce banking network. And that was amazing. Like, wow, an online banking network. That's really great experience right there. So I went ahead, I dealt with the design of that and the deployment of that. I took care of all aspects of that. So really, how did I gain that kind of experience? Now, of course, that was from reading, you know, being certified, reading networking articles, reading about best practices. And that's really the main difference between a a network engineer and a network architect, or basically an engineer or an architect for the most part. That in a engineering role, as a network engineer, as I said before, that is focused on operational work. You configure a router, routing, switching, data center services, DCIs, who knows. And you deal with the support model. Something broke, they call you, you troubleshoot and fix the problem. That's what it is. That's the focus of the CCIE model, basically, or the CCNP and the CCNA. Now, the design track, what does that kind of focus on? Because that's not focused on operation. Design is really focused on really two main components. It's based on best practices and it's something that I crafted together over the years called technical objectives. And I'll talk about that next because another user had a great question about how should I design a network and where do I get started? So I want to share that with you guys in the next part. But when it came to that transition, it just never really happened like that. I just knew the technical objectives of how to do a design or how to, de how to design a network. And I knew about best practices. Cisco has a lot of these documents called their SRNDs. Now, it's not called that anymore. It's called the Design Zone on the Cisco website. There are a lot of design documents out there. You read those, and those I saw underlining themes for what that was really all about. So that's kind of really how this happened for me to become an engineer to an architect. It was just on the job, Projects came up that required design work and the senior person, which was myself, took care of that work. And basically it kind of just grew from there. Another question that was asked was by Tanya Brown or Taz. And she said, do you have any advice for designing and deploying a small network infrastructure? It's for a school project. How would I get started? So let me kind of talk about that a little more. So. Probably five years ago, probably a little bit more, I'm not sure, at least five years ago. So I published um, a book, my first technical book, which took me 10 years to make. And that's called the Network Design Cookbook. 
And it was that particular book where I basically did a brain dump of everything I have learned, how I design networks and put it right into that book. That's what I still use today to do a lot of my design work for customers. And that particular book was important to me because I gave the structure of how to do a design. So the question that was asked by Matt that we just talked about initially, that how did you learn to do design? What was your resources? It really was on the job and reading about particular materials. And I mentioned that it was about best practices and about technical objectives. So I want to kind of give you a quick summary of what the design cookbook is really all about. Now you get more details at our website on the design cookbook. There's also a video series of how to do design using the network design cookbook. So you can check that out to get more information and resources if you're interested in doing design work. Okay. So the first thing that should always happen, and it's pretty simple is gathering the requirements. I can't design anything until I figure out what do you want? You got to figure out what is the requirements. So you're talking to the business team, the management staff, that could be the director, people who are responsible for IT. So you're not talking to the CEO unless they're involved in making IT decisions and they're going to define what the requirements are. You're talking to the engineers if you can. You're talking to some of the end users if you can. There's a reason for that. You're talking to different management teams. You want to communicate with many different people to get their requirements. Really about what do you want? What kind of services are you looking for? They may say, oh, we want internet services. We want to be protected. We want to do cloud-based services. You want to get information about what do they want? Because that would be important to figure out what kind of solutions and services needs to be considered like a LAN, a WAN, a data center, an internet edge, a firewall. You're trying to figure out exactly what solutions are required. And you do that by answering, by asking those kind of questions about what they want. You also want to kind of figure out details about what are the current challenges, whether it's in their existing environment or in past environments. A lot of companies, when they have a network, they will have different challenges that they have in terms of things not working, things uh, failing. You want to figure out what their challenges are so you can address that in the design. That's a very, very big thing, though. That's something that you should start looking at when you start architecting networks. What are the challenges and resolving those particular challenges? So part of these requirements, besides figuring out what are the challenges, what solutions and services are they after, including budgetary kind of considerations, because there's many different ways for designing a network. And understanding the budget is important to kind of figure out what is a better fit based on what their budget what their budget is. But the other component that is required, this is the meat and potatoes. This is the most important part of the requirement process of the entire design process is determining the technical objectives. So what are they? They are the following. It is performance, reliability, scalability, security, flexibility, and network management and monitoring. I call it PRESFIN. That was the particular acronym that I use in the design cookbook. That really is what makes up a good design or a bad design. So let's talk about what each of those really, really mean. First, or number one, you want to figure out the performance requirements. This is in regards to the throughput, to bandwidth that is required on the network for the LAN or data center, even for the internet itself. And this is really dependent on what applications or services will be used. And what is the typical bandwidth used per connection by a user? Those are things that are very, very important because that can make a big difference for the type of hardware that is required. Now, this information is typically um, given to you by the system administrators or the system engineer, including the desktop people or the application support people. They're the ones that have to give you that information. Now, they may not know that those details, so it may require communicating with the vendor because they will provide, they should have that information available. And that's important because it gives you an idea that if a client is connecting to this particular application and a typical connection is roughly 100 kilobits per second, well, you need to figure out how many concurrent connections could possibly exist during peak times, you know, 
You want to figure that out so you have enough adequate bandwidth available on the network. So that's why you want to ask performance related questions about what is the requirements of bandwidth that is needed based on the applications that are used. You also want to kind of figure out the quality of service as well across the network. And this is where if there is voice and data, that's important to figure that out. So you know that QoS needs to be put in place to give voice a priority compared to data traffic, for example. Another one is with reliability or redundancy. How much redundancy is needed for the network that you're designing? Is it full redundancy? Is it partial, maybe a little bit redundancy, or maybe it's no redundancy at all. And this is really important because the more redundancy you add, your cost will also increase, especially if you have multiple um, clouds, like an ISP cloud or a private MPLS cloud, for example. Your costs will really double because those are recurring costs that you have. There's also support costs as well. So many companies quickly say, oh, no redundancy though, but it all depends on their support model and their own um, service level agreements with their own customers. So here's the main question that I always ask every environment that I'm a part of, of trying to figure out their redundancy um, needs. I tell them though that most outages will happen, um, you could be down for four hours at a minimal. It could be six hours, it could be even eight hours. I have personally seen that. But four hours is typically how long you could be down. That means nothing is working. There's something that is impacting your business. And yes, you may have an RMA contract. So you may get the new hardware, which could come within two hours. It could come within four hours. It depends on what you have purchased, okay? So great, you got the new hardware. Well, you got to basically unrack the old equipment, put in the new equipment, apply the new configuration, uh, make some cabling changes and do other kind of verification. There's a lot of moving parts there. So you may be down for four hours at a minimum. So the question is, what is the impact to your business in four hours? Which means after the four hours is done and you're operational again, how much money have you lost as a business? Because clients could be pretty upset. I would be very upset if my website goes down, okay? So other clients could be the same way. They could leave their business altogether, which could be a big, big contract for that company. They may not want that. So if the impact is really high compared to the cost of that redundancy, then it might be worth that redundancy components as part of your design because you could lose business. You could, you could lose clients. Those are the main questions that you want to ask and then make sure that the company is fully aware of the risk of having redundancy or no redundancy. Okay, a third point is with scalability. And this is about the growth of the network for additional users, servers, other networking components. Now, a lot of people, when they design work, uh, this, is a, this is a typical kind of mistake, they build for today. And sometimes, I get it, you have to because of budgetary considerations. They can't design a network that's going to consider having 500 more people. I got that. But you want to figure out the potential scalability of the environment. So if someone says, yes, we have 13 people today. Well, great. What are you expecting in a year or two years from now? Oh, 500 people. That's a big difference there. And really scalability just come down to the type of topology that is designed. And that's really what we have all learned from our CCNA days. That is basically this one tier, two tier, or this three tier topology of a core access layer, for example, if it's a two tier. That's important because that will help with providing scalability, that I can have a core and I can have an access switch that my desktops connect to, okay? And you could say, oh, we have 10 more users coming in, but we're out of ports on our access switch. No worries. We get another access switch which plugged into the core. That is a hierarchical infrastructure, and that's why that is, the, that is the most important piece which makes up the scalability component of any design. So you want to figure out is the growth of the company in terms of servers, desktop, and services, and making sure that the design considers that growth. Another technical objective is with security. Now, this is something that is more of what you would provide and do. So most business owners, they won't know about, oh, let's implement um, BPDU guard. That's for you. But really security is about implementing best practices, 
best practices on all of the networking components on the switches, the routers, the firewalls, and other appliances. It is for you to apply best practices and to make sure that there's no exploits anywhere on what you are designing or what you're recommending. Because remember, as a architect, you're, pro you're providing a design with a list of particular requirements of how it should be deployed. And you're giving that information to the network engineer. So then they're looking at, looking at that and they go, okay, I'm configuring a firewall, I'm configuring this core and access switch, I'm going to configure the LAN switching best practices for root guard, loop guard, uh, BPDU guard, or BPDU filter. Just giving you some examples of that. Um, IP source guard. Those are particular best practices that is in line with providing security for the environment. So you want to kind of you want to ask them any particular security needs that they have and, and accommodate that for the, for the design. But really, this is about best practices and making sure that you're implementing that for all of the solutions and services that are being deployed. The next technical objective is one of my favorites. It's something that is very unnoticed by a lot of engineers, and that is flexibility. Now, what does that mean exactly? Flexibility is the ability of designing a network today but considering future solutions could be added to that network over time. So I've seen this a lot of times, and that is like with voice. So let's say, for example, that you go in to do a design for a complete wide campus infrastructure, a LAN. So you got your core layer, you got distribution in different buildings and access layer switches. Fantastic. Well, one of the questions to ask during the requirement phase is to figure out what solutions are you considering in the future that could be added at a later time, like voice? Now, they may say, oh, we're not looking about voice, but you want to kind of figure out, is that something that is possible? Because that can change how the hardware is chosen. Because if, they, if you design a LAN without voice, sure, you have your core, your switches, and you're great. Then a year from now, they could say, yes, we do need voice. Well, that means we have to change out the access switches to support power over Ethernet. So that means that now their cost has just increased. So if they were to consider that in the future, then when we design the network initially, we have switches that support PoE. So when that time comes, it's already there and ready to take voice without any additional cost to the company. That's what flexibility is about. You want to figure out additional solutions that could be added to that network over time that may not be initially outlined. And you're using those considerations as part of how you're designing the network for the company or for your customer. And the last part is with network management and monitoring. I kind of grouped them together. So network monitoring is very simple. You want to make sure that you're introducing or bringing up to the company that you want something to be your ears and eyes of the environment. You want to present proactive monitoring, not reactive monitoring. So that means that you want a solution, a server, an NMS server in place that can check for faults and performance issues on the network. That it can check this at a regular interval and alert your support team to take immediate action or take action before it becomes a immediate problem. That is a really, really a big part because that can help make your network more reliable. So that's why the network monitoring aspect is important to bring up and to introduce as something that needs to happen. Now, the other part is network management. And this is really understanding, this is important. What is the, what is the support model for your organization? Who is managing this network that I'm going to design and potentially deploy for your environment. Who's going to be support? Who's going to be who's going to be doing the day-to-day -day operations for this network? And that's important because if they say, "Oh yes, there'll be a couple of CCNA um, individuals," so I can say, "Hmm." So I need to be careful if I introduce MPLS or uh, Easy Virtual Network or VRF Lite or Fabric Path. I need to be very careful of introducing these um, services because this team will have to manage that. And learning about MPLS, that requires a skill set. That's more CCMP, CCIE level. 
So I have to keep that in mind. Now it may require documentation and training, that's perfectly fine, but it's important to understand who's going to be supporting this infrastructure. So that's what you gather from those requirements, the technical objectives and trying to figure out exactly what's needed for solutions and services. And that's where basically the second part of the design process comes, which is designing each of these solutions that are needed. It's going to likely be a LAN or data center, internet edge, firewall solution, a WAN, maybe voice. Those are typically the main common solutions. And you want to design each of those solutions based on each of the technical objectives. So if you're looking at a LAN, okay, you're going to do a design for a local area network. So that means you want to consider how it's going to be scalable, having a hierarchy infrastructure, topology basically, a core layer, maybe an access layer. You're thinking about the redundancy aspect to it. You're thinking about the flexibility aspect to it. You're thinking about how it will be managed or how it will be monitored. You're thinking about the security aspects. Everything that you do for the solution design is considering the technical objectives. And that's what you really need to focus on. Okay, And it's also the, the particular um, phase where you figure out what hardware uh, will be used for, the, um, you know, for each of the components in this particular solution. So that's something to definitely keep in mind and what you would do during this particular phase. And from there, you would design all of these services that are required based on the solutions that are used. And it's very much the same thing. You want to kind of keep in mind of all or some of the technical objectives like security, performance, scalability. You should always have that in your mind for every decision that you make for the design process. So what do I mean about solutions and services? I've been talking a lot about that. So let me quickly give you really a great example that illustrate this. So a solution is like a completed puzzle, like 500 piece puzzle. And each piece is a service. So I can say, I'm going to design a LAN solution. Well, in this LAN solution, it will contain routing, it will contain switching. It will contain some security protocols. It can contain tunneling protocols like MPLS. There could be many different type of um, services, maybe even solutions. But really, each piece of this puzzle represents a particular service that will need to be implemented correctly that will make up what this LAN solution is. And really, from there, you start presenting some design options. Now, there are many, many ways to come up with a design. There is different hardware, different topologies. Some could have redundancy, some may not have redundancy. So based on the requirements that the customer wants and the technical objectives that you determined and you designed out all of the solutions, you designed out all the services, all that's completed. Well, you need to present a couple options. Okay, it could be up to three. If it's four, if it's one, just some options to present to the customer. You, you can provide estimated pricing as well, um, but just say these are just estimated numbers because you want to kind of quote them hardware costs, things like that. So you want to present options, and one of those would be what you recommend. So there could be some particular type of thing that you recommend and why. So you want to present these nice options to the company so they can see these are the different options I can choose from. These are the pros, these are the cons, these are the recommendations, these are some of the considerations and risk involved. So the company is fully aware of the risk. So if a company says, we don't need redundancy, we don't need voice, we're good. You want to make sure that you outline those risks, that if their requirements change, that they do need voice, it could um, basically increase their cost of getting brand new hardware. So keep that in mind. And also, if they, don't, if they want no redundancy, as I talked about before, they have to consider that as well. That if the impact is high, could be four or six hours, and they lose um, customers, it could cripple their business. So they have to be aware of basically what they want. You want to make sure you give them awareness. You're, you're, you're the engineer. You're giving recommendations. So you want to make sure that, that they are aware of what they really, really want. And because that can present new challenges for them. Okay. You can't force a company to have redundancy or to have scalability, though. Their decisions is based on monetary decisions. So that's their choice. As an engineer, you can only do your part of giving what you recommend. And those technical objectives does exactly that.
And of course, in the process, there are other things as well that you would do during design work, such as developing a naming standard for all the devices. It makes things very organized for your documentation and how they're entered into the network monitoring type systems. So that's really, really important. Also, having an IP addressing schema that is used and can easily be identified for the type of network that it is and the location. So those are things as well to consider. There's also data center facilities, like how you do your, um, you know, for power, cooling, cabling. Those are aspects that your data center should have if your network does have a data center um, premise. So that's really how you do the design, where you should get started. So I talked about a lot of that, all of that in more details, examples and such in the Network Design Cookbook. And again, there's a video series that uses the Network Design Cookbook to deploy a wide number of solutions like LAN, Internet Edge, WAN, Firewall, is a lot of great stuff up there. So if you want uh, resources of training of how to do a network design, kind of based on what I talked about with the technical objectives, that video series um, does all of that perfectly. So check that out for more details. And we are done with this episode. So thank you very much for your great questions. And as always, I wanna hear from you guys. So post your questions below in the comments about anything in the networking field or being a network engineer and your question will come up in a future episode. So if you wanna see more videos like this in the future, please subscribe to our channel and also check out our practical training, our video training on our website at roadhub.net. We got a lot of cool stuff. So thank you for watching this video and I'll see you guys next time.